Welcome to Our Interesting Times with host Timothy Kelly, who interviews today's top alternative and revisionist thinkers. May you live in interesting times. Welcome to another episode of Our Interesting Times. Um, our guest tonight is James Perloff, jamesperloff.com. He is the author of the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, sorry, Shadows of Power, an expose on the Council on Foreign Relations. And um, also the his latest book is Truth is a Lonely Warrior. James, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing good. Uh, thank you very much for having me back on Our Interesting Times. Well, thank you for coming back. Glad to have you back. And well, you uh, recently uh, penned this uh, rather provocative article uh, to 9-11 and beyond the Rothschild Israeli obsession with nuclear weapons. So um, what uh, cho- what uh, d- uh, made you decide to write about this topic? Um, it really got its launch when I read a book called Atomic Bomb Secrets by David Dionisi, and he was writing about the atomic bombing of Nagasaki, actually. And he pointed out some things about it. You know, I'd already known from my own study of history that the atomic bombings of Nagasaki and Hiroshima were not necessary because the Japanese were already suing us for surrender on the exact terms that we accepted after the atomic bombs were dropped. So these bombs were not militarily necessary. But what DNAC focused on was the religious aspect. It seems that Hiroshima was not the main target. Hiroshima was probably more like target practice for the prime target, which was Nagasaki, which we always think of as the secondary target. Nagasaki was the Christian center of Japan. Actually, you're a Catholic, Tim, right? And um, yes. And Nagasaki was very Catholic. Uh, the archdiocese had recorded uh, long before the atomic bomb came down that there were uh, at least 50,000 Christians, mostly Catholic, uh, in Nagasaki. And the atomic bomb, the fat man bomb that was dropped there, round zero, it was directly dropped over Yurikami Cathedral, which is the lo- it was the largest cathedral, Christian cathedral in the entire Far East. Now, Harry Truman later said that the target had been the harbor of Nagasaki, which would have some minor military justification, but actually the plane overflew the harbor, went three miles further inland, and dropped that bomb right over the largest Christian cathedral in all the Far East. That is not a coincidence. I might also add that Nagasaki had banned the Freemasons in 1926, so when you're the 33rd degree president of the United States and a 33rd degree Freemason, I'm not saying that he was the main uh, um, factor, uh, main um, uh, brain behind this, of course, but uh, certainly approved of it. Uh, There's a little payback there as well. But there was a big spiritual dimension to this that I had not understood before I read David G. Dionysi's book, which I've reviewed on my website, jamesperloff.com. It's the only book that I have reviewed that I find that so uh, informative and provocative. But it turns out, David, that one reason for taking out Nagasaki was they knew that they were going to compel the emperor to renounce his divinity. And when that happened, they did not want Christianity to move in and fill that void. And... I, I corresponded with DNAC. I wrote, uh, you know, gave him a five-star review, of course, on Amazon. And he's also written a couple of books on 9-11. And he pointed out something to me that I had never even thought about with 9-11, which was that 9-11 and, as well as Nagasaki, were actually like a burnt offering on a massive scale. You know, if you look at the spiritual dimensions we're now seeing with the elite, You know, we've all seen the, uh, most of us have seen those uh, tapes that Alex Jones made of the cremation of care at um, Bohemian Grove, where they're having this uh, human sacrifice or mock human sacrifice for a statue of Moloch. And that goes back to the days of Canaan, when they had child sacrifices to Moloch. Now we're seeing, we're talking about this off air a little about Pizzagate before we started the show, but now we've seen this pedophilia We're seeing John Podesta's ties to Marina Abramovic in her spirit cooking, where they pretend to eat from corpses. 
And we've seen these photographs surface of a 1972 Rothschilds party where they have baby uh, facsimiles on the dining table. And it's getting pretty horrible. Look at this, this TV show called Lucifer. And they've unveiled a statue of, of Baphomet in Detroit. And it's, it's, you know, the whole satanic, which you and I have understood for a while, but it's really getting out there. Um, but what Dionysi was pointing out, you know, 9-11, besides being a uh, geopolitical event that created the police state here in America and all these foreign wars in the Middle East, which were big motives, it was also this burnt offering, like a burnt offering to Satan, to Lucifer on a massive scale. And that was a dimension I hadn't thought about before. But nuclear weapons were actually open, opening up the sort of portal of mass sacrifice and a the what the main article uh, or the main portion of this article I've written is about is the fact that 9/11 was indeed like Nagasaki a nuclear event and we'll be talking about that but I do want to get into some of the background of nuclear weapons which led up to it. Oh, what's one thing interesting is uh, about the uh, Manhattan Project is where they first uh, tested the bomb. Uh, what it's called Trinity, right? Yes, Trinity. a lot of a lot of names. Was even the fact that they called it the Manhattan Project uh, becomes pretty interesting. But you know, you have you know, of course, the, you have Christianity and particularly Catholicism. You have the Holy Trinity, and you're right. working at Nagasaki as the uh, you know the capital for Christianity, particularly Catholicism in Japan. But it's sort of a um, a mockery or, or blasphemous mm -hmm. use of the you know, Trinity as a site for this. Invention, the testing of, of of this weapon, which would be used, you know, you know, according to you, uh, uh, sort of a um, a mass uh, burnt offering, which is you know, <laughs> satanic and sacrilegious, of course. But that's always, that's always been interesting. Um, but in the article, you get into background, as you, you mentioned, um, uh, to this uh, is the the development of the bomb and um, the importance that the bomb played. Uh, of course, you know the, the bomb is detonated in 1945 uh, over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, but this also coincides with the uh, roughly coincides, you know, with the creation of the Israeli state in 1948. Mm -hmm. But of course, you had all the politics and intrigue and fighting that, that led up to that in, in the 40s. Um, you talk about this espionage that was going on in the United States that the Kennedy administration, at least John F. Kennedy, had. Caught on to and was pressuring uh, the uh, Israel to cut back on its nuclear development, uh, making a making a condition for economic aid. Right. Uh, I, I I use the word obsession in here. It's interesting. Uh, you know, I would use the word obsession. The Israeli Rothschild obsession with nuclear weapons. If you look at Wikipedia in its article on Israel and nuclear weapons, it actually. Wikipedia itself uses the word obsession. It says that David Ben-Gurion, who was the first prime minister of Israel, was nearly obsessed with nuclear weapons. And in fact, as you know, the nuclear, um, well, excuse me, the, the Israeli state was officially created in 1948. Harry Truman recognized it within minutes of its creation <laughs> after what John F. Kennedy reported to be a $2 million bribe that was given from the founder of APAC. But... Um, Rumor has it he was he's, he, he's offered offered either gold or lead. <laughs> oh, okay. I think yeah. it was a suitcase. I think he went for the cash, and yeah, uh, yeah. That, that gives that gives new meaning to the his phrase. The buck stops here. Yeah, <laughs> it really really did stop there. Apparently, according to John F. Kennedy. Yeah. Uh, but John F. Kennedy figures in this too, as we'll see in a moment. But there was um, uh, this obsession uh, with nukes with Israel. Uh, they started their nuclear weapons development program in 1949, which is really strange. I mean, one year after the state is proclaimed, they're already begun their launch into developing nukes. And that is very, very strange since nukes were still new on the scene. But there was nuclear espionage going on, which always involved Zionists prior to this. And a couple of landmark books on this. One was from Major Jordan's Diaries, which was published in 1952. But... Major George Racy Jordan had been a Lend-Lease expediter during the war, and he was in charge of Lend-Lease going to Russia through uh, this Great Falls, Montana. And, uh, you know, there'd be planes coming in and taking off, and he kept a meticulous diary. One day he got a call from Harry Hopkins, who was overseeing the overall 
Lendley's program. And he said, you know, there's certain packages coming through. You know, I just don't want any attention given to these. Just let them make sure they get through. And well, he did give them attention and he didn't always know what he was looking at. But at, at that time, nobody even outside of inner circles even knew there was such a thing as a nuclear bomb. And at the time, he didn't know. But he did determine that what he'd seen uh, was the plans for the atomic bomb going through in diplomatic pouches, lab equipment for the atomic bomb, as well as uh, uranium and other chemicals that were necessary for the Russians to develop their first atomic bomb. You know, before Israel, which I don't know how you understand it, but I understand Israel as the Rothschild's proxy state. Um, you know, because it, it was first generated by the uh, the, the Balfour Declaration, which was I- issued to Lord Walter Rothschild. And the Rothschilds have always played an immense hand in the creation of Israel, which I regard, which many, most Christians, evangelicals regard as this uh, rebirthing of biblical Israel. I regard it as a satanic counterfeit, not created by God, but by Rothschild financing. And that's why uh, James de Rothschild is on, I, I think he's still on their 500 shekel note in Israel. But in any event, there's all this nuclear spying. Harry Hopkins, who gave this order for this uh, these atomic secrets to go to Russia, which was the Rothschild's first proxy state before Israel. Israel didn't exist during World War II, so, but they gave our nuclear secrets to the Soviets under the guise of Lend-Lease. And, um, of course, uh, when, I, when I say that Russia was uh, the Rothschild's proxy state, this goes back to the Rothschild's financing Lenin and Trotsky, and um, if you read Under the Sign of the Scorpion by Jerry Lena, he documents from declassified KGB files that it, the orders for the execution of the Tsar and his family came from New York, not from Lenin and Trotsky. Lenin and Trotsky didn't move without getting orders from Kuhn Loeb and from the Rothschild. So it was it was a proxy state to begin with. And another another book uh, that documented the Rothschild's involvement in stealing nuclear secrets it's a great book, but it was one that was pretty much suppressed in England. It's called The Fifth Man by Roland Perry. Now, that came out in 1994, and Roland Perry documented that Victor Rothschild, the most feared man in England and the most powerful banker in England, directly was involved in sending Britain's nuclear secrets during World War II to the Soviet Union. He had himself made... Uh, head of state security during World War II. That's how powerful he was. He was an MI5 inspector of all things. And in that capacity, he sent Britain's nuclear secrets to the Soviet Union. And this is corroborated after Glasnost by the KGB agents who he spoke to, who Roland Perry spoke to. And when he's talking about the fifth man, what he means is that Rothschild was the fifth man of that famous spy ring of uh, Burgess, McLean, Philby, and Blunt. The other four were all caught, but nobody was ever going to bring Victor he, Rothschild. He, he to, was a, the, fifth, yeah, the fifth man of the uh, yeah. Cambridge Five, right? Right. He was the yeah. fifth man, but nobody dared to name him. He was so powerful. And uh, by the way, he is the father of Jacob Rothschild, who we, most of your listeners know. Uh, Jacob Rothschild, along with Evelyn de Rothschild, being regarded as uh, perhaps the two most powerful men in the world. Evelyn de Rothschild honeymooned in the Clinton White House. And, of course, with a big, he and his wife, Linda Forrester Rothschild, were big, big backers of Hillary Clinton. I don't think they're very happy about her losing the election. Uh, but there's one other aspect before we go into 9-11. Well, one of the things with the Rothschild's uh, espionage in, in, in helping the Soviets uh, get the bomb, uh, he wasn't motivated by Marxist-Leninism. Len- right. No, no, no. He was a <laughs> capitalist. But you had this, always had this irony, uh, as I'm sure you know, uh, if you've read um, – um, some of the books like Anthony Sutton, like Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution, a Red Carpet. Um, these books have documented all the assistance. Uh, you know, the uh, uh, David Rockefeller during the height of the Cold War had private landing rights for his jet in, in, in Moscow, mm-hmm. and uh, Chase uh, Manhattan Bank had uh, had its uh, um, outlet at uh, I think it was One Red Square. I mean, they were doing big business with the Soviet Union during the Cold War, and they were giving them all kinds of credit, um, basically interest-free. And, uh, you know, PepsiCo was involved with this, and Arm and Hammer of Occidental Petroleum, and um, uh, so many figures were involved in transferring technology to the Soviet Union and building it up while it was still in this uh, Rothschild proxy state. But, you know, when the Cold War ended, 
I have an article on my website called uh, Did the Cold War End So the War on Terror Could Begin? When the Cold War ended with Gorbachev coming to power in 1985, 1986 began the War on Terror with Reagan bombing Libya based on a Mossad deception, which I describe in that article. And you can read about in Viktor Ostrovsky's book, The Other Side of Deception. Ostrovsky, of course, a former Mossad agent. Mm -hmm. As soon as the Cold War stopped, we started the War on Terror on Israel's behalf. And uh, that's another story we won't be getting into in any detail tonight, I, I don't think. But um, there's, there, there was one other aspect of this, uh, which is the Kennedy assassination. But let me pause here. You may have some something to add or comment on what I've just said. Well, uh, I want to put this in its proper, uh, I guess, historical and political context. Uh, we're talking about the uh, relation uh, between the um, – Israel's nuclear program and the, the Kennedy assassination. In, in the decades prior, uh, particularly in the 1940s, uh, right after the Second World War, there was a rather extensive uh, arms smuggling operation being run by uh, uh, some Jews in the United States um, to uh, ship uh, weapons to the uh, Jewish fighters in Palestine who were, I guess, trying to uh, uh, I guess, uh, push out the Arabs, the Palestinians, and sort of deliver a fait accompli uh, prior to the UN, uh, I guess, resolution and of course, uh, Truman's subsequent recognition of, of the Israeli state. Um, but one character involved in this one was uh, Hank Greenspun. He was the editor of the Las Vegas Sun uh, newspaper. Um, and uh, he uh, uh, reportedly got like a 10% kickback on this arms smuggling operation he was he was running. Basically, he was helping um, or involved in a, in a, in a uh, smuggling operation that was uh, pilfering uh, or war surplus material, particularly arms, machine guns, grenades, and such, and having it shipped to Israel to the fighters in Israel, he actually was convicted under uh, for violating the neutral the neutrality act because uh, there was an arm it was an uh, international arms embargo on Palestine at the time, and I think he did, he received a ten thousand dollar fine for that violation. I guess he could consider it a cost of doing business, um, and. Uh, uh, well, one thing that's interesting is the uh, uh, his son uh, uh, claimed uh, that uh, uh, that Frank Sinatra was involved in the smuggling operation. <laughs> Apparently, Frank Sinatra served as a bagman in New York and delivered cash to a, um, a, a ship's captain in New York Harbor, who then subsequently, um, I guess, uh, uh, transferred arms to uh, to Pal Pal Palestine. Um, there's also the uh, issue of the uh, the Numec plant in Apollo, Pennsylvania. This was a uh, uh, I guess a, uh, a refinery a plant uh, that um, a certain amount of plutonium went missing uh, when the Atomic Energy Commission audited it, and some people think that th that uh, uh, plutonium found its way to Israel and you know, to its nuclear program, and that was run by one I think is Zalman Shapiro, a Zionist. Um, and then, uh, of course, later on we have the case of Arnon Milchin, this uh, Hollywood mogul producer. Uh, he bragged that he was a part of a of a uh, Israeli, uh, uh, you know, espionage program involved in uh, shipping uh, arms and particularly uh, uh, material related to Israel's nuclear program. Uh, I think that he was involved in the shipping of nuclear triggers, and he owned a company that uh, <laughs> actually employed uh, uh, Bibi Netanyahu. I guess he'll, he'll, his name will come up later in in, in, the, in the discussion. So, well, Timothy, you're, you're laying some stuff on me that I hadn't actually heard before. It isn't yeah. really surprising to me, in as much as we know that Hollywood was a, a Jewish town. I think yeah. that's uh, reasonable to say. Um, you know, uh, whether you're looking at 20th Century Fox or MGM or Warner Brothers or uh, Paramount or Columbia, they're all uh, Jewish owners. The only non-Jewish early studio was Walt Disney, and he, as I have uh, heard, it was a 33rd degree Freemason. So. I wouldn't be surprised if Hollywood uh, people were uh, playing a major role in some of that. Did, but did you have like a guest who talked about this stuff, or is this these are these uh, uh, materials that you've that come across in your own uh, study? Most of the come across come across this in my reading. I read an excellent book about Las Vegas, which covered Hank Greenspun, called "The Power hmm. and the Money." Hmm. It's very good about Las Vegas. It's kind of how Las Vegas itself is sort of a um, well, it's sort of a microcosm of, of 20th century America. Uh, in terms of corruption and uh, intrigue uh -huh. and, uh, you know, uh, 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 s more or less um, deep state operations. Uh, huh. That's where entertainment, the mafia, politics right. uh, intersect. And Holly Hollywood's the same way. Las Vegas so and Hollywood. did you find there were a lot of Zionist intersections in Las Vegas? Yes, because that's the Lansky operation. And okay, the Lansky right. operation is, is what I think connects what, what you're going to be talking to, which is the Kennedy assassination, because – 
uh, well, I'll let you talk about it. But that's the you know the Permadex and Clay Shaw and all that. But um, mm-hmm. but go ahead. But I thought that was that's this is the background that there was this uh, Israel, uh, Zionist illegal arms smuggling operation extensive in the United States that was stealing uh, uh, more or less World War II surplus uh, armaments uh, and shipping them off to Israel. Okay, that does a lot to explain how they got armed so quickly in order to uh, massacre the Arabs. Okay, mm-hmm. that uh, that starts to make uh, a lot of sense. You're filling in a hole for me in history. Yeah. I'll have to look and, at some of those and, materials. And Kennedy himself, because because we're talking about the Kennedy assassination, of course, the movie JFK was produ- that was directed by um, oh, what's his name? You know that director, uh, Stone, JFK. Oliver Stone. Oliver Stone. Oliver Stone. Oliver yeah. Stone yeah. Um, that was produced by Arnon Mil- Arnon Milchin. Who was the guy I mentioned? Who was involved in nuclear espionage uh, on behalf of the Israeli state? And he's, <laughs> I mean, he bright. He got a medal from the Israeli state for for his espionage. And so we why- could we could safely call JFK cognitive dissonance. Then throwing out a lot of uh, misdirection in in terms of limited yeah. hangout because nowhere yeah. is it mentioned. Remember, because JFK is sort of this vague blame it on the military industrial complex. No names are ever mentioned. Mm-hmm. And uh, of course, the Israeli connection, which I wasn't familiar with until a few years ago. Uh, came up, um, but yeah, but he made sure that there was no mention that the Israelis were included in the cabal that you know came together to you know, to uh, murder Kennedy in 1963. Uh, but um, but, uh, so, but um, yeah, that's that was interesting. He uh, Arnold Milchin, he's the one that he, he says uh, he says, do you know what it was like to be a 20 something guy whose country decided to let him be a James Bond? Wow, his country now his country is the United States. His country is Israel. From what I understand, he's right. also an American citizen. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that's the attitude. That's the problem. Well, a lot of these dual citizen people, you know, Philip Zelikow, who headed up the 9-11 Commission, was a dual citizen. And Michael Chertoff, who was put in charge by the Justice Department of investigating 9-11, was a dual Israeli-American citizen. So what are we doing with foreign citizens running these investigations, right? Yeah. It's the, and this is what Shimon Peres said about uh, Hank Greenspun. Uh, a hero of our country and a fighter for freedom, a man of great spirit who fought with his mind and soul, a man of great conviction and commitment. Of course, he did this on behalf of a foreign government against his own government. Yeah, uh, so, you're filling in a lot of holes for me, uh, so. and I very much appreciate that. By the way, uh, the reason I asked, uh, did you find a lot of Zionist connections in the Las Vegas scene is Hollywood, which is a Jewish town, always portrays it as an Italian town. And I don't know if you remember the um, old Untouchables show, but – they always portrayed the gangsters as Italians, and what particularly cracks me up is the you know the Purple Gang was uh, a, a Jewish mob. It was the Russian Jews. Mm-hmm. But if you watch the Untouch- Robert Stack Untouchables, I'm talking yeah. about uh, there that episode called the uh, the Purple Gang, and they were all goys. And Steve Cochran of all people was the head of the gang. You know, <laughs> so you got no you got no hint. You got no hint that there was any Jewish identity. By the way, you and I are not anti-Semitic. We, we you know, uh, we know there are many good Jewish people. And my father, by the way, is, was Jewish, so I'm, I'm half Jewish myself. So this, we're not, we're not, we're just talking fact here. We're not trying to. Uh, we have absolutely no. Well, uh, yes, if I were talking about uh, William Stevenson and the man, and the British Special Operations Executive and the British intrigues in the 30s and uh, the, in the early 40s that dragged the America and the United States into the war, I'd be being being critical of British or people. Yeah, you're anti. You're racist against the British. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So you know the no. British have always been victimized by uh, racism, as we all know. You know um, the um, the British well, Empire course. was you know really a reaction to anti-British um, discrimination. But it ties into it because you have the issue <laughs> of, of British philo-Semitism, which dates as far back as Cromwell. At least. Right. But, um, yes. Yes. Big, yeah. big connections there and a lot of intermarrying. But anyway, I, don't, I, I guess we better c- kind of keep it on the track. But um, the reason why, reason why I talked about that is because this lead, I'm trying to create the, uh, well, create, uh, give the idea of what was going on. Uh, what was, Ken- what, this is what Kennedy was going up against uh, in the early 60s. For sure. Um, he was yeah. running up against the same forces that have really been taking control of our world for centuries now. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is an ancient, ancient battle, actually. But Kennedy. You know, I wrote a cover story on the Kennedy assassination in 1988 for the New American, and one of the great frustrations I had was that I read about 40 different conspiracy books and articles, each of one each had its own theory, and none of which really hit a home run. But, you know, none of them in 1988 mentioned Israel. It wasn't even on the table. I mean, um, I mean, they were uh, 
I mean, they, they were talking about LBJ, they are talking about CIA, they are talking about the mafia, or the French Algerians, or the Soviet Union, or the KGB. You know, I was writing for, this, for the John Birch Society, and I actually came across an article that claimed the John Birch Society did in Kennedy, and so I joked <laughs> with the editor, I said, I hope this one doesn't turn out to be right, or they'll be taking us away in handcuffs, but uh, nothing hit a home run for me, but then you had uh, Michael uh, Collins Piper come out with his book, Final Judgment, and actually, I was slow on that one. I didn't really get deeply into it. I, I looked at it sort of like, okay, we got another theory here. It looks kind of circumstantial. But what really uh, knocked it home for me that Michael Collins Piper did get it right was when Mordecai Venunu was released. You know, he was an Israeli nuclear technician who was persecuted because he revealed Israel's nuclear program, which is an ironclad secret. And he was in prison for 18 years. And when he came out, he said, wait till people find out that Kennedy was killed for opposing Israel's nuclear weapons program. That's how important this program is. And I found something else which just kind of stunned me. And I'm going to read it to you. Uh, see, I uh, before the Internet, there weren't a lot of alternative media resources. And, but one of the best was a newsletter that came out. It was by... Um, uh, Hilaire, Dubier, du, Hilaire Duberrier, he uh, was an old OSS guy, and they kicked him out of the OSS after the war, as they did a lot of people, for being too anti-communist. And he started his own newsletter that he ran out of Paris and then Monaco from 1958 to 2001. And I met him when he was at 90. He's a real gentleman when he, when he came to Boston for a visit. But uh, he had an article in his September 1963 newsletter. Uh, I've got all the copies, so I'm just going to read what it says. Quote, Israel tested her first A-bomb in September 1962, a product of the Beersheba plant in the Negev Desert. But the halting of this Beersheba plant was part of the package America agreed to deliver on the test ban treaty signing. In late July, American planes flew over the Israeli reactor site at Damona as a reminder. The new government under Levi Eshkol did not push its protest. For actually, though Cairo, London, Paris, and Brussels knew the details behind Ben-Gurion's recent resignation, the American and Israeli publics are still in the dark. Here is what happened. On the eve of the Harriman Gromyko talks in Moscow, President Kennedy wrote a letter to Premier Ben-Gurion telling him to halt his atomic re research and dismantle his plants. If he refused, a revision of America's relations with Israel would be necessary. Literally, it was an ultimatum. Ben-Gurion looked over America's financial aid and special laws favoring gifts and bequests to Israel and called it blackmail, unquote. So here you have Hilaire de Berrier, intelligence specialist, describing Ben-Gurion's fury over Kennedy's ultimatum. And he wrote this, I have it in front of me, two months before the assassination. This is not written in Heinz. This isn't a, a post-assassination theory. He's putting this up there two months before it happened. And this is for their validation of Piper and Benunu. Now, would you say that he, they were just among the consortium of uh, interests that, that wanted Kennedy taken out? Well, you know, I have found myself, Timothy, when you look at different events, they often have multidimensional reasons when they go ahead with something like, I could give you at least six reasons for the Spanish-American War. Sugar was on the, probably on the top of the list, but there are quite a few others, such as yeah. destroying the destroying the populist party and knocking out Spain as a world power and reuniting the, the, the South with the North in order to create the United States as a world police force. I mean, there's all kinds of, if you look at World War One, you know, part of it was looting the American public for munitions that were never manufactured, but it's also about the League of Nations. It's also about the Balfour Declaration. It's also about the Bolshevik Revolution. It's also about the espionage and sedition rights, which uh, destroyed rights here in America. Mm -hmm. So they often have a multidimensional reason for doing something. And so it's quite possible that the Vietnam War and some people have talked about Kennedy wanted to put his own money. You know, I, I know that the author of Creature for Jekyll Island, Jerry Griffin, on his website said he looked into that. He did not believe that was correct. I think that the their obsession with nukes probably makes that on the top of the list, but I wouldn't be surprised if they had secondary reasons that maybe, you know, uh, were the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily tell us who the actual mechanics were. <laughs> and they no, it doesn't. Could have been Corsicans paid for, you know, through a bank in Switzerland owned by 
someone like you know Tibor Rosenbaum, who was owned Permadex, who you know something mm-hmm. like that. That's how these things go down. I mean, really, it's, it's a hall of mirrors. It's so murky that to, to get that type of specific information is probably a, a fruitless. You know, a, you're going down a rabbit hole on that one. It's to find out who is that, who actually did it. And as years go by, it becomes less less important to find out who the actual killers mm-hmm. were. Because um, I think with Kennedy actually dealing with an actual milieu. <laughs> And so when they asked uh, Nixon, I'm, I'm not saying Nixon was right, but this kind of explains the situation. Or being honest, they asked him who killed Kennedy, and he, his response was Dallas killed Kennedy. <laughs> you know, as in you know, just the the whole uh, atmosphere down there, the interest. And I guess you could be talking about the, uh, you know, when he says Dallas, you could be talking about the Yankee and cowboy interest that had come together in, in the uh, you know in the uh, that stage of the Cold War. You know whether it's opium in Vietnam or the the military industrial complex and the, and the war contracts, you know that backed Lyndon Johnson these things. So it, it mm-hmm. is really it, it's a, it's a confluence of interests. Yeah, I think that's probably reasonable to say. I've tried to get away from uh, going into the Kennedy assassination because of the great number of cognitive dissonance, uh, red herrings, and and rabbit holes that are there. I mean, there's just thousands of them, and. Um, I, I I try to stay away from it just because I don't want to try and get into that detail about who actually pulled the trigger and when. But um, but it definitely I, wasn't Lee Harvey Oswald. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I have a I have an excellent book um, uh, called uh, November the twenty second, nineteen sixty three. You were the jury by David Bellin, which made a case that Oswald did pull the trigger. And, you know, he followed the exact movements of Oswald that day. It makes a mm-hmm. pretty convincing case. But I I, need, I would have to revisit it um, with what we've learned since then. But I, I've tried oh, I mean, to stay away he, from he, it he since 1988. He definitely, he definitely wasn't the lone nut. I mean, no, he definitely wasn't the lone nut. Not if uh, we have all these <laughs> other motives involved. Uh, there's, yeah. there's obviously um, uh, but, a but great deal. As far as the Israeli connection is, is that something that's never been really grappled with before? And Michael Collins Piper did that, and for that, yeah. he, was, he was labeled an anti-Semite. Of um, course, yeah. but um, I guess is that connection because of Clay Shaw's ties to Lee Harvey Oswald and he, the fact that Clay Shaw worked for that trademark. He's also a CIA asset, which was later proven. So mm-hmm. Garrison was vindicated, um, but um. I believe it was Tradebot, which was owned by Permadex, which is this uh, shadowy company that was owned by this guy Tibor Rosenbaum, who owned that bank in Switzerland. I think that's that's the connection he draws. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, it's the um, – what's the name of it? I forget the – Credit Swiss Bank or something in Switzerland. Mm-hmm. Credit and Swiss, that, yeah. yeah. And so that's the, con- uh, that's the connection I'm familiar with uh, drawing in the Israelis is Clay Shaw was the link. Okay. Is that, what, is that what you found, or uh, you know, I have not. I have to revisit Piper's book, and okay. uh, the material is much uh, fresher in your mind than it is in mine. Actually, it's, it's been uh, a few years since I've actually looked at that book. Um, but Venuda's revelation and De Berry's finding uh, brought it to the forefront for me that uh, Piper got it right. But the details I would have to look at again. But that sounds about right. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it would be nice to it would be nice to nail it down. For sure. But uh, to take it up to 9-11 and just to connect it to, I've made this point in other shows, but if you looked at two moments in time that most have affected the American consciousness over the last 60 years, you'd probably have to say it was the Kennedy assassination and 9-11. And when we look at nukes and if Kennedy was killed over nukes and if 9-11 was indeed a nuclear event, then we have these events not only corresponding in terms of their impact, but in terms of uh, what was actually taking place. So let's talk a little about 9-11 as a nuclear event. As you know, that there's, there's three major theories there, uh, in addition to the government's theories of, of planes and pancake and floors. Uh, it's nanothermite, directed to energy weapons, dues. It's proposed by uh, Dr. Judy Wood and nukes, and I am increasingly persuaded that this was a nuclear event. And what I start out with in, in this part of the article, when we start to talk about the evidences for a nuclear event, this is not an evidence, but it's, it starts us off on the right foot. I have a quote, and I actually have a clip, which I'm not going to play here, but you can play the, you can uh, click and play the uh, clip on my article. On my website, jamesproloff.com. Just click, just hit the blog. It's it's the first article there on the blog. 
Um, Benjamin Netanyahu was being interviewed by Tom Brokaw two days after 9-11. And here's what he said, quote, in 1995, I wrote a book called Fighting Terrorism. And I said, that if we don't arrest the tide of militant Islamic terrorism, then the next thing that will be is not a car bomb in the World Trade Center, but a nuclear bomb. And, you know, this is like going right by Tom Brokaw, you know. <laughs> and then uh, Netanyahu, uh, perhaps at this point, realizes he's, he's given away a little too much. And so he says, Quote, now it wasn't a nuclear bomb, it was a 350-ton conventional bomb, end quote. Okay, so you got to wonder, um, how does he know it's a bomb? Because, you know, uh, uh, the, the official understanding was that it was just the planes involved. But we know that if anyone would have known what brought down the towers, it would have been Benjamin Netanyahu. And the article, I, I recommend people read the most so they don't understand the Israeli connection to 9-11. It's a Wikispooks article called Israel Did It. And they just lay out dozens of connections. But, of course, you've got the dancing Israelis. You know, these were, at least two of them are no, were no, known to be Mossad agents. They were photographing the buildings as they were burning. They were high-fiving each other. And as I, as I point out elsewhere, when you high-five someone, that's a, a congratulations. You know, you've, that's accomplishment when you high-five. And they were laughing and cheering and dancing. That's what they call them, the dancing Israelis. And they were arrested. Of course, they were allowed to go home by Michael Chertoff two, about two months later. But you had Zim Navigational, uh, which was the uh, big Israeli shipping firm located in the World Trade Center. They broke a 30-year lease to move out shortly before 9-11. And you've got Israeli, uh, Israeli, an Israeli-owned firm handling airport security at, at Logan Airport. You've got Danny Lewin on Flight 11, uh, right behind Mohammed Atta on the flight passenger manifest. He's a former commando with uh, the Israeli uh special forces and uh he had himself photographed before 9-11 with a backdrop of a pa two panels that looked like the twin towers and he was he was wearing a watch which was a hijacker model swatch watch and the hour hand the minute hand the second hand the date were all set to the 11 with a big smile on his face i mean <laughs> he, really? i mean yeah uh, you can see that those pictures in my article called um um it's on flight 11 uh, unraveling the mysteries and, there, uh, there's a, um, a magazine cover, I think it was April or May 1967, with David Rockefeller. Yes. Newsweek. Right. And the new era of banking, I think, is the headline. And he's overlooking Manhattan, you know, where the tw Twin Towers are going to be, because they're being, I think they're, they're just being built at that point. And his watch is on 9 and 11. <laughs> and there's so many of those. I mean, yeah. in uh, the movie The Matrix, Nemo's uh, passport expires mm -hmm. on September 11, 2001. Of course, it was made in, I think it was 1999. And you've got the, you know, the famous uh, Illuminati card game, which shows two buildings, two skyscrapers, and one is blowing up. It says terrorist nuke on that card. And it's also got the Pentagon. And you've got the uh, all the predictions about 9-11 in uh, Back to the Future. It just goes on and on. But um, anyway. So, oh, sorry, so he, sorry, get back to Net Netanyahu's remarks. He says it was a 350-ton conventional bomb. Right. And I've seen studies that show that the amount of explosives you would need, the amount of dynamite you would need to take down the Twin Towers or one of the Twin Towers be between 300 and 400 tons. So he seemed to have nailed 350 is very specific. Yeah, but I, mean, um, that, I think you said it. You said it earlier. This is the, the understanding, at least the key, uh, the official narrative is that it was the impact and jet fuel, that, burning jet fuel that caused the, the Right. So why is he saying bomb? And he's boasted of the fact that he predicted a nuclear bomb. Actually, I, I bought his book, uh, Fighting Terrorism, because I was so, so interested in these remarks. And he predicted to be placed in the basement, and we'll be getting into that basement of the World Trade Center. But here's where his connection to Larry Silverstein becomes important. Uh, now, uh, we all know that Larry Silverstein, less than two months before 9-11, became the new owner of the World Trade Center, purchasing a lease uh, for $124 million. And they got an insurance payout of almost $5 billion. Now, that's good uh, investing skills. That's good futures investing when you can uh, bet $124 million and make $5 billion back, right, in two months. Well, that's why they call him Lucky Larry, right? Lucky Larry. Plus, the other part of his luckiness was the fact that he and his family and his partner all have managed to avoid being on 9-11 on uh, the day of the attack, which normally they would be there. But Lucky Larry happened to have a podiatrist appointment that day. Um, but his Netanyahu connection here becomes very important. So I'm going to quote the Israeli newspaper Haaretz, November 2001, quote, The two have been on friendly terms since Netanyahu's stint as Israel's ambassador to the United Nations. 
For years, they kept in close touch. Every Sunday afternoon, New York Times, Netanyahu would call Silverstein. It made no difference what the subject was or where Netanyahu was. He would always call, Silverstein told an Israeli acquaintance. Their ties continued after Netanyahu became prime minister, unquote, Haaretz. So what better way, if you wanted to put a couple of suitcase nukes into the World Trade Center, what better way to be able to do that, to be close friends with the center's new owner? So um, he's in a regular contact with, with BB. Um, mm-hmm. Of course, he uh, wreaks a huge profit off the destruction of the towers. Uh, who benefits? Who, yeah. who benefits? Kui Bono, yeah. Um, so the, the the theory that there there are nuclear that there it was a nuclear uh, weapon or some sort of device that brought the buildings down. Um, of course, that's very controversial. Um, now, uh, is there is there anything at the site a signature or evidence that would indicate that a devi- nuclear device was used? And what about the concerns about radiation or fallout? That you right. With a nuclear device. Let's address both of those. And there's a ton of evidence that this was nuclear. And uh, there was a book that got completely overlooked. It was published in 2006. It was called Ground Zero, the Nuclear Demolition of the World Trade Center by William Tayhill. And very few people have, have read that, but I linked to it. You can read it online. And what he pointed out in that book was that it made a number of points, but three major ones he made was, number one, the U.S. Geological Survey examined the World Trade Center dust samples, and they found inexplicably high amounts of the products of nuclear fission, along with uh, uranium. They found beryllium and strontium and thorium, and you just really couldn't explain these things other than a nuclear device. The second thing he pointed out, too, was the the heat. Uh, an, an atomic bomb is in intensely hot. It actually reaches millions of degrees right at its center. And then as you move out, it becomes hundreds of thousands of degrees and then tens of thousands of degrees as it's exploding. And you had this uh, three more than three months after the incident, you still had smoldering fires at, uh, at the, uh, in the bottom of the heap of the world trade center. And of course you had all this molten steel. Uh, so there was intense heat, which a nuclear bomb would account for. He also pointed out, that at Palisade, New York, there had been seismology readings, and I I, uh, I took a, a screenshot of from his book, but you can I refer to the book that's page seventy seven. He's got the uh, seismology graph there, and there's this gigantic spike that just goes off the charts uh, in an instant for both uh, buildings being taken down, and you cannot equate that to a gradual collapse, but it's just off the charts seismological spike. So those were the three things that he pointed to. But now we've got additional evidence, Timothy. Uh, And one of them is thyroid cancer. Now, we know that the first responders are getting lots and lots of cancer. But the one type of cancer that they get more than any other in comparison to its expected rate is thyroid cancer. And the reason that is so significant in terms of a nuclear bomb is that a nuclear bomb, uranium or plutonium, will give off iodine-131. And iodine-131 embeds itself in your thyroid, and that's why – I've got some of these myself, by the way. It's potassium iodide tablets. You can get them on Amazon. There's they're something to keep on hand in case of a nuclear attack. It protects your thyroid. So the fact that the first responders are getting all this thyroid cancer, it, that is a smoking gun signature of an atomic bomb. Um, let me pause here. There's more of nuclear evidence, but let me just pause here. Now uh- – so when you say suitcase nuke, uh, what specific weapon or device are you talking about? And in the article, you, you mentioned a couple of, uh, I guess, battlefield nukes that were developed during the Cold War that might have been used. Oh, yes. Uh, well, let me get to those because that uh, uh, raises the whole question of where's the Geiger County radiation readings. But let me just mention um, three more evidences for nuclear okay. weapons, and I'll get to that. Um, one is the, the insides of the... Twin Towers were vaporized. Uh, no furniture survived. No computers survived. Of 10,000 filing cabinets, one from the basement survived. Uh, of course, all the people inside were vaporized. Uh, more than 1,000 people, no even DNA sample you could fit in a test tube uh, left behind. And, of course, the concrete was pulverized. And uh, an atomic bomb, 
unlike a conventional explosion, doesn't just go boom. It lasts, as you know, if you watch the picture, it, 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 its force continues, and it's extremely hot, and it could account for this vaporization of the interiors and the melting of the, um, the steel columns. Another evidence is the explosive force. Uh, there's no more powerful explosive than an atomic bomb, and we have chunks of the World Trade Center when multiple tons were thrown hundreds of feet, they, they flew 600 feet and knocked over the winter garden atrium. And uh, it, I'm sure many of you people have seen this, but I've got a picture in the article of the American Express building, which is across the street. And there was a, a huge multi-ton chunk of the Trade Center that impaled itself on the tr side of that building. You know, it takes a tremendous force to throw it. That's not a, obviously not a collapse mm -hmm. that, that would have done that. Uh, another thing is the... Um, the dust cloud, you know, that was a horrific dust cloud. And if I've got um, footage of uh, we call um, battlefield nukes exploding and they do create a ground level uh, massive dust cloud. And uh, but if you watch a, a normal building demolition, people are standing aside. That's a dust cloud, but not not like the one that uh, that expanded from uh, the Trade Center. Yeah, it was it was pyroclastic. Yeah, it was it was ama it was frightening and, and and massive, and of course they also called it Ground Zero, which is kind of interesting because uh, actually Dmitry Kaliza pointed this out when he was talking about nukes was called Ground Zero because uh, I have some older dictionaries and now they'll include it. I give them broader definition, but it was strictly nuclear before my 1994 Webster's New World Dictionary defines Ground Zero as quote the land or water surface area directly below or above the point of detonation of a nuclear bomb unquote. So. Um, uh, that's, of course, uh, superficial evidence, but I, those harder evidences I gave you, I think those uh, cumulatively point very – I'm not going to be dogmatic about it, but I think they point very strongly to a nuclear event, especially when we add in Dionysus factoring in of the Satanism of the burnt offering and, uh, and of the burnt offering at Nagasaki. It starts to really tie together for us. But well, I'll, I'll move on to the Geiger counters when we pause here. Yeah, that's when you get into again the uh, the explosion itself. Like I said, it's pyroclastic, almost look like a, a volcanic eruption, as opposed to uh, you know, I think it was materials being being spewed out, and it was vaporized material. It appeared to be at least. Um, yeah, but as far as the actual you know pinning it to an actual device, uh, we've heard a lot about vague talk about suitcase nukes. Uh, but what what exactly are they? Uh, and, they're, they're nukes that are small enough to carry in a backpack. And um, that's what uh, really uh, starts to irritate me when I think about Larry Silverstein, when I start to think about the dancing Israelis. You wow. wouldn't actually need a big, big device. Um, but people will ask, well, where's the where's all the Geiger counter radiation and uh, readings that should be going with a nuclear bomb? And so what needs to be pointed out is that during the Cold War, the United States started to develop what they call tactical or battlefield nukes. Because if you're in a battlefield situation, you don't want a nuke that gives off a lot of radiation like happened at Nagasaki. You want a minimal uh, radiation. So it, if you look at nuclear weapons today, they are normally a combination of fission and fusion. The Nagasaki Hiroshima bombs were fission bombs. But uh, nukes today are a combination of fission and fusion. Fission, which is the breaking up of an atom or nuclei of an atom, will give off lots of radiation. But if there's lots of fusion, fusion is the combining of a nuclei together, they also give off lots of explosive energy. They give off a minimum of radiation. And Edward Teller used to say it was the goal of the United States to develop a completely clean nuke. Now, they never did that, but they did develop weapons that are minimal in radiation. We even developed a, a uh, something called the Davy Crockett recoilless gun which launched a nuke battlefield nuke and obviously you're not going to nuke your you know kill your own soldiers with radiation this would be a minimal uh, what we call mrr minimal residual radiation bomb they do have those and then you have to ask okay what kind of nukes would israel stockpile and we don't know that because they keep it a complete secret but obviously they would want to keep on hand a large quantity of minimal uh radiation residual nukes or, or battlefield nukes because if they get into a war with their neighbors they don't want to uh, launch a nuke on a uh, neighboring country and have uh, radiation blowing back to israel so they would uh, obviously most likely specialize in these low radiation nukes but there's a couple other reasons but let me pause there 
Now, with these uh, with these nukes, um, uh, just because uh, well, you have ben- Benjamin Netanyahu's, rem- Netanyahu's remarks, uh, and you have evidence of say a nuclear device being used to uh, vaporize the towers. Um, what exactly would pin that to Israel, other than you know? you can infer some sort of benefit from Israel got, got, got from the war. Well, okay, yeah, we, we, war and terror, you know? we did say, uh, you know, who benefits. We talked about uh, the personal benefits that Larry Sullivan's team we'd had. But, of course, Israel, in terms of, uh, was the beneficiary of 9-11 in mm-hmm. geopolitical terms. I mean, America didn't benefit. We got the TSA. We got the Patriot Act. We got uh, interminable wars and debt and loss of civil rights. The Muslims didn't benefit. They've, they've had absolute chaos, and their uh, Afghanistan's been destroyed. Libya, Syria's in the process of destruction. Uh, Egypt in chaos. Um, uh, Afghanistan, you know, just war after war in the Middle East. The Muslims didn't benefit. Only Israel, and you know about their plan for greater Israel, has sat sit back and watched as the American military has taken out one enemy after another. And I'm sure many of your listeners are familiar with the remarks of General Wesley Clark, where he said. Uh, right after 9-11, he was told in the Pentagon that they were going to take out seven Middle Eastern nations, which, of course, starts to clue you as why we went to wars like Iraq when there was no evidence of a WMD. The, the, the WMDs in Iraq, where the plan was already there, and the beneficiary was Israel. And, of course, they had uh, the means and the motive. They had the motive, and they had the means in terms of these uh, the ownership of the World Trade Center. Uh, a close friend of Benjamin Netanyahu, mm-hmm. Israeli agents celebrating right after the attack, even photographing the event and the means in terms of their uh, their stockpile of weapons. We don't know how many they've got, but most uh, experts do concur that Israel has hundreds of nukes. Now, would you say um, Israel was involved? Um, yeah. Uh, because there is other evidence. Um, now, I'm trying to get it. Are, are you arguing that it was solely in as is- an Israeli operation, or was, were the Israelis just part of a group, uh, part of a consortium, if you will, that worked to pull this operation off? Well, because we have other evidence, uh, at least we appear, appear to have evidence that would implicate elements of the uh, United States national security state. Um, one was uh, this uh, able danger that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Schaefer revealed in his book. This was a DIA uh, operation. There was apparently uh, uh, following uh, the alleged hijackers that were shut down at the last minute, and then they did, went and destroyed two terabytes of information. Um, we have the Brady bonds, the $240 billion uh, uh, in bonds that were issued in 1991. That was part of uh, Operation Hammer, the looting of Russia that was pulled off by George H.W. Bush, the CIA, and Wall Street. Um, you also have NORAD and the apparent stand-down, their, their failure to get the planes up. And intercept these these um, hijacked aircraft. Um, you also have, you have other financial chicanery. So, uh, would you say you know, Israelis were the ringleaders, or were they just a uh, just a, a member of a consortium that helped pull this operation off? Well, I think that uh, when you look at the power pyramid and you look at the Rothschilds and mm-hmm. the degree of significance they attach to Israel, I put Israel probably and the Rothschilds probably at the pinnacle of this. But you know, okay. you get cooperation, you do need to offer rewards. And so, of course, you, you're right about the Brady Bonds, and I understand that the, uh, I believe it was the Bank of um, Nova Scotia had its gold located there at the World Trade Center, was supposedly taken out by truck that morning. That's right, you had the gold and, heist, yeah. And then you've got the missing $2.3 trillion, which is from the Pentagon, which is announced by Donald Rumsfeld the day before 9-11. And, of course, you've got whatever hit the Pentagon destroying the accounting offices where the accountants were working on that problem. So I would say this is a layered thing, but I consider the Israelis very close to the top. And Doug, Doug Zakheim was the Comptroller General of the Pentagon at the time, right? Yes, and a Zionist, right. And a Zionist. And, um, now, one other thing you bring up in the book, I mean, sorry, in the article, is uh, some of the questions regarding oh, well, the actual uh, um, attacks themselves. One of them is the the uh, anomalies regarding how the planes interact with the buildings and what does this suggest? What, what, is there media, media fakery going on, some sort of um, trickery going on there, uh, su- suggesting other means of technology, like a, whether it's a hologram or some sort of media fakery? I mean, when I read that article, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at this and I, I'm familiar with the problems with the um, mm-hmm. the official story. I have a, you know, an aluminum plane can penetrate a 
reinforced con- steel, reinforced concrete, <laughs> traveling at 540 miles an hour at <laughs> sea level, which I didn't think was possible, which I don't still don't, don't think is possible. Right. Um, nevertheless, I saw it occur. Now, this is my position is on that is that like the vast majority of humanity, I witnessed 9/11 on the TV set, which means I'm watching through the medium of the news, the media, which. <laughs> can be faked or at least manipulated. Um, but you addressed that in the article about uh, the possibility of some sort of trickery going on there. Right. Uh, let me uh, uh, do that. I also want to talk a little about the uh, damage to Building 7 and what went on there and how that is actually further evidence of a nuclear explosion. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, I don't... oh, oh, well, okay. Well, let me, let me do that and then let's do the planes. Okay. Um, we had uh, these other buildings that caught fire uh, building five was absolutely ablaze, and I'm, there's clips you can see on YouTube, or you can you can uh, link to it from my article. And building seven was certainly on fire. And Barry Jennings, who worked for the New York Housing Authority, was on his way out of building seven with a colleague when there was a huge explosion which took out the staircase beneath them, and they had to retreat upstairs and eventually were rescued by the the fire department. And building six was totally cratered out. It was a crater that went to the to the uh, basement. And so the question has always been, what happened to these other buildings and why do they have these internal fires? It can't be from debris. You know, um, there was something very strange. Well, that, I mean, I mean, didn't Barry Jennings say that there were explosions going on inside Building 7 before the towers collapsed? He did say that, uh, but I don't believe that there were fires there. I think that he contradicted his colleague about the timing Okay. Um, which was a you know it's a pretty traumatic event. I think he had some of his timing is off. If in fact these fires in, in buildings five, six, and seven were started before the twin towers collapsed, you would see if you, in your images we of all these images of the twin towers as they're burning, you would see smoke plumes coming from those smaller buildings, and you would have had TV announcers saying we seem to have a third building on fire now, um, and uh, there's just no way that those buildings were were on fire before. The towers collapsed. It mm-hmm. had to be uh, some people. It had to be during or after. Uh, some people said that there were bombs in those other buildings. But the problem with uh, that is if if they were so successful at bringing down the twin towers with demolition, why did they fail to take down the other buildings? Except for, of course, Building Seven did collapse at five twenty, which was an obvious controlled demolition. But mm-hmm. uh, the the theory I'm propounding here and it's uh not me i've you know but i you know i get emails and i see tweets and i follow what what people are thinking is uh this has not been discussed very much at all but underneath the the world trade center the buildings were connected by not tunnels but wide pipes which are part of a uh sewage and um uh, especially important for our uh understanding is the stormwater drainage system. In fact, I'm just going to quote, it may sound a little boring, but it, it just explains this damage. This is from the World Trade Center Property Risk Report that was prepared for Larry Silverstein. Quote, stormwater, roof drains convey the stormwater to, by gravity to the various building drains located on level B1, this basement one, which uh, connect to the 36-inch stormwater drain that discharges into the Hudson River. The water and the machinery drips are drained into the very sump pits located in level B6. That's the lowest basement level. Now, um, the sump pumps discharge the water into the two 36 stored storm water drains on level B1. Okay, uh, I want to, uh, that sounds pretty abstract. Let me explain what's going on here. Uh, Netanyahu said that the nukes would be, he predicted they'd be placed in the basement of the World Trade Center. Now, the ideal place, and I go into this in detail in the article, you can see the schematics. I've got three schematics of the elevators. There's only one elevator in each building that went the entire distance of each building. It was Elevator 50, which is located approximately at the center of each twin tower. It was the only elevator that went down to the lowest basement level, B6, and its service pits were actually carved into the bedrock. That is the lowest place you can find in the World Trade Center. Now, this makes an ideal place to put a suitcase nuke because if it explodes there, it's, it's sideways force and it's downward explosive forces are going to be largely contained by the bedrock and the explosion will follow the path of least resistance up out of the bedrock and through that empty elevator shaft and until it, it, it's, as it's melting those, those surrounding steel columns, it's going to hit that airplane, quote unquote, airplane strike zone first. 
But in terms of explaining why these other buildings were hit and caught fire, in addition to Elevator 50 going down there, you also have the pipes that drain water. As you know, Tim, when you have a flooding situation, water will go to the lowest level. And so Elevator 50, you have not only the elevator shaft, but you've got the sump pump pipes that go up to this system that connects the entire World Trade Center. So the nuke explosion is not only going to follow the path of least resistance up through Elevator 50, it's also going to follow the path of least resistance into this three-foot wide pipe that interconnects the entire World Trade Center. And I believe that's where you get this down-up burning out of these other buildings. That's why the other uh, other buildings outside the World Trade Center didn't catch fire. They didn't catch fire from debris. Not, none of the uh, buildings outside the World Trade Center caught fire because they weren't connected to the underground system. It wasn't debris that caused those fires in buildings five, six, and seven. I believe it was the underground. It was secondary force of the nuclear explosion going through those uh, that three foot wide pipe that connected the entire World Trade Center. And I believe that will. Um, and that includes your toasted cars in the garage, which is also connected to it. And in the article, I actually have um, a clip, and I've, I've taken a still from that. You can see geysers of steam that turn to uh, smoke. As the towers are collapsing, you can see these geysers going up. I believe that is the, the underground water system as the uh, nuke, secondary force of the nuke propagates through that system. So I do believe that accounts for that damage to buildings 5, 6, and 7. And I don't know that... The Israelis anticipated that. That may have been um, completely unexpected. And uh, I also think it's possible that Building 7, and we call that the smoking gun of uh, 9-11, I think that Silverstein may have decided to collapse that building because, you know, Barry Jennings talked about all these dead bodies he had to step over in the, in the lobby of Building 7. If Larry Silverstein hadn't pulled Building 7. He's got a lot of explaining to do. He's got to explain why those dead bodies are there. He's got to explain why all those fires are there. That's a pretty distant building from the World Trade Center. By by simply demolishing it, he he no longer had to explain that. He could just say, hey, you know, the building was weakened and, you know, it fell, rather than having to explain all that other phenomena that didn't go along with the official narrative of what had happened on 9-11. Hmm. And now with Barry Jennings, um, he... Uh well, he went in a, into, a hosp, into a hospital and died uh, at age like 51 or something, I believe. 53, uh, yes. 53. Mm-hmm. And if I recall, it was was it Dylan Avery who had interviewed him? And um, he's the one I think did loose change. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Mm-hmm. But um, he went to his house to see – to talk to the family and they, and they had – he claimed, I believe, the house was empty. They were gone. And Barry Jennings did say that uh, he had threats over the fact that he talked about the dead bodies. In, uh, yeah. He said he wasn't supposed to talk about that. That was uh, apparently where he stepped over the line in his revelations. But he was a credible man. He was uh, an emergency coordinator with the New York Housing Authority. I believe it was also the case where a private investigator uh, was looking into it and returned the money and said, I can't, I, I can't look into this. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Yeah, so um, that's that's that, that's strange. Now, um, as far as the, uh, the the this this theory regarding nuclear weapons, uh, nuclear uh, in the demolition of the towers, uh, um, and you have a section in the article about its implications for the truth movement, because other people have offered differing uh, uh-huh. uh, different theories. You mentioned a nanothermite. One is the directed energy weapon. That's Judy Wood's theory, um, and. Uh, how other uh, researchers have sidestepped or ignored the Israeli connection. Um, uh, so what, what's going on within the truth movement uh, regarding 9-11 and um, uh, you know, the, the uh, I guess, the controversy uh, uh, that's there you know, with, with those competing theories? Would, would you remember how we talked about the Kennedy assassination and uh, how the movie JFK kind of threw people off the right scent? And, you know, mm-hmm. you've got to throw a lot of cognitive dissonance out there. Now, I want to say this up front that I have uh, friends and uh, in architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth, I, friends who are members. Mm-hmm. And I have great respect for uh, the intelligence of people who are in both those camps, the, the Dew camp and the nanothermite camp. Um, 
However, I, I found it interesting that Tehill's book, which is the first book I'm aware of that proposed a nuclear demolition, came out in 2006. Then in late 2006, all of a sudden you had architects and engineers, which, you know, they advocate the nanothermite theory primarily. And also late 2006, you had Judy Wood come up with her do hypothesis. Now, here's something that I find pretty interesting. I had the pleasure of meeting Chris Boleyn, who's a, a great 9-11 researcher this summer during his speaker tour. And uh, Chris gave a recent radio interview, and I linked to it from my article. And at the 42-minute mark of the interview, Chris said that he was approached by a Mossad asset in Germany who asked him if he would be interested in writing about a do explanation, a directed energy explanation for the World Trade Center destruction. This is well before Judy Wood started talking about it. Now, it makes sense to me that Mossad would like that because Israel doesn't have space-based beam weapons. It, that's the thing about that. It takes them off the hook. And uh, reading, uh, you know, uh, I also mentioned here Kevin Ryan, along with Dr. Stephen Jones, is one of the leading nanothermite proponents. Now, he wrote a book called Another 19, Investigating Legitimate 9-11 Suspects. And uh, Corbett recommended the book, so I, I got a copy, but I was surprised that he doesn't consider Israel a factor at all. In fact, uh, it isn't until three, page 312 that he gets to Israel, and I'll just quote what he says. He says, quote, Israel has also been discussed in terms of the possibility that elements of its government were involved. Unfortunately, such claims are often made without supporting evidence and coherent reasoning. Although there was evidence that Israeli intelligence knew details about the attacks in advance, the story of the dance in Israel is verified as for knowledge. Many governments had many governments had advanced knowledge of the attacks, unquote. So he just kind of dismisses the Israeli idea there uh, pretty abruptly. And he, he never mentions Larry Silverstein as a suspect. He mentions Larry Silverstein in passing, but he never mentions that Silverstein got an insurance payout. And he never mentions Larry's, like a Larry's doctor's appointment. Why wouldn't he be on the list of uh, suspects? I just found that interesting. Um, so I, again, I have the greatest respect for people who believe in nanothermite and um, the do hypothesis. I'm not saying those are ruled out here. But I think that a nuke can take care of all that dustification and other phenomena that you're looking at on 9-11. Um, and I think that uh, it's what ties Israel in. And that it's possible that these ideas, as Chris Boleyn has indicated, were introduced, at least the do hypothesis was uh, introduced to him by a Mossad asset, uh, with the obvious intention of uh, getting Israel off the hook for the job. And drawing people's attention away from the nuclear explanation that Tehill had come up with. We're talking 10 years ago now, 2006. Mm -hmm. Now, you also bring up the issue of, of the plane strikes themselves, which I, uh, I mentioned earlier. Um, yes. Uh, the oddity of the anomalies of, of all four cr crash sites, but particularly the ones that were f most filmed, of course, were the, um, were the tower impacts, um, which – we all saw the plane you know, cut through the uh, the building like <laughs> hot, knife through hot butter, uh, which is hard to um, kind of reconcile with um, normal physics. Right. And, you know, uh, Tim, when I first was uh, heard the no planes theory, I just gasped and I said, oh, no, you know, tinfoil, you know, even as a truther myself, I said, you know, this is cognitive dissonance. This is people trying to make the truth movement look so ridiculous. No one will listen to us. But. You start to look at the Pentagon, how come they don't have any shots of that uh, plane coming in, and how come you've got April Gallup, who's a Pentagon employee, who walked right out that hole and says she didn't see the slightest sign of a plane, not a, uh, not a body, not a suitcase, not a you know, seat cushion. Uh, people have looked at that, and there was a French writer a few years ago say, where's the plane? Was a plane at the Pentagon? Same thing with Shanksville, just a hole there, right? Mm -hmm. They threw in a couple of red bandanas that the terrorists supposedly wore, but where, where's all the evidence for the plane there? And, of course, the main evidence for the plane hitting the South Tower is the, uh, those shots we've got. But as you pointed out, the impossible physics of aluminum flying right through 14-inch steel columns, it can't happen. Plus, the speed of the object, even Wikipedia says it was going to – Flight 170 is going at 590 miles an hour. 
Now, top speed for a one uh, Boeing 767 is supposed to be 424. They can do over 500 at at uh, great heights, but at ground level, they can't reach 590 miles an hour. And pilots for 911 Truth talk about this, and they also point out even if you could reach that speed, the plane would be out of control. And they've got dem- they've got um, video there at pilots for 911 Truth where they demonstrate that experienced Boeing 767 pilots with thousands of hours of flight time, they couldn't hit the Twin Towers at high speed. So how did the terrorists do it, who had never been in the cockpit of a uh, uh, Boeing 767 before? Really impossible. Those guys couldn't even control a twin-engine Cessna at 65 miles an hour. No way did that happen. So uh, I ask, are you still there? Yeah, okay. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I know I'm kind of uh, going for a while, but uh, I asked, uh, Chris Bolin about his thoughts this summer when he gave his talk. He had a you know Q and A Q&A afterwards. I said, Chris, what are your thoughts about no planes? I said, I'm not dogmatic about it. We think about no planes because of you know these impossible physics. And he said that the problem is that you can see on the footage of Flight 175, which hit the South Tower, you can see this missile pod that lights up when it. Uh, and you can see that even on CNN, if you play CNN's footage real slow, you'll see that missile and you'll see it light up as it. Uh, makes contact with the tower. Now, he said, why would they make a hologram of a missile? That doesn't make any sense. Well, as I look at it, uh, I believe that the best hypothesis is the one put forward by Richard Hall. Uh, You know, a lot of people said that these images of planes were computer CGI's, computer graphic imagery made after the fact. But Richard Hall did a computer study of every film footage that exists of Flight 175 is from many different angles, and it always follows the precise same trajectory. And he said that proves that something really did hit the Twin Towers. And for my money, he's right. He says what you've got is a real missile. Boland's right about that, but it's not a real plane. And it turns out that there's an Israeli firm called El Op, which was, we've got declassified information on this now, El Op was developing holographic technology with stealth applications back in the 1980s. So you could fire a missile in cloaked as an airplane, projecting an image of a hologram. In fact, holographic technology is so good today that you know, they can make Elvis Presley come alive on stage. It looks like the real Elvis. You can make a very real image of a plane if you want to. And I believe, I'm not wedded to this theory, as I say in the article, uh, but I, I think that that is probably the most likely explanation that what we're dealing with on 9-11 is two suitcase nukes and four cruise missiles. And what really makes it very interesting to me is that in 1999, Israel commissioned her first Dolphin-class submarines. These were her first submarines capable of firing cruise missiles. Um, and prior to that, she just had these old 1970s style subs. But 1999, she was putting out these these uh, cruise missile firing subs, which, uh, you know, a cruise missile is hardened. It can penetrate, unlike the plastic nose of an airplane, which you've probably seen pictures of them being crushed by bird collisions. And a cruise missile can be very precisely directed uh, during, you know, during the Gulf War. We launched cruise missiles on Iraq. We're talking 1991 Gulf War here. And you might remember General Norman Schwarzkopf giving press briefings where he showed how the cruise missile was so precise that you could uh, send them down an Iraqi smokestack at a factory. That's how, how precisely you can guide them. So uh, I'm thinking, uh, and this ties, this ties I'll tie this back to nuclear weapons, but I, uh, and I wouldn't have brought it up if it didn't have nuclear significance for the future. But um, I believe that is a probable explanation. When you look at the no evidence at the Pentagon for a plane, no evidence at Shanksville, it starts to make sense that they use the same device at all four locations, which is a cruise missile. As far as Shanksville, of course, they ditched that one. Either they didn't need it any longer or something went haywire and they had to just, just drop the missile. Hmm. Now, the well, I think isn't, aren't there reports of an eight-mile debris field or something uh, in Shanksville, which would suggest that whatever it was, it fell apart in midair or something, the plane? Um, yeah, uh, I need to study that in greater depth. Chris Boleyn did talk about that. He felt that, uh, well, that a plane was definitely, uh, you know, there, there were planes on 9-11. Yeah. Uh, let me make, there was, uh, there were planes in the air and something happened to flight 175 and something happened to flight 93. And that might be separate from the missile. You might have flight 93 being destroyed. Uh, there, there, there were, you know, early reports that actually there's footage you can find on YouTube 
where you have an Air Force official saying that Flight 93 was shot down. Um, mm -hmm. So perhaps one of the planes was scattered about. That would be separate from the missile, which is on its own mission. Well, and it, as we saw in the Northwoods document, they were you know, planning to, uh, to a plane to take off and switch it out with some sort of drone or correct you know, later on. And that's what that's what Chris Chris Bolin subscribes to is a drone yeah. theory. And you're very right. Operation Northwoods was I think they used that as sort of a prototype on 9/11. Operation Northwoods was a plan to. Uh, justify an attack on Cuba, which you might be able to justify. But the idea was that they would send up uh, an airliner. Uh, the airliner would be uh, substituted for by a drone plane. The airliner would then dr land at a military base. The drone plane would continue to Cuba, it would send out a distress signal. It would be detonated. And then a claim would be made that Cuba had been shot down, had shot down the, the airliner, which in the meantime had safely landed at an air base. I believe that probably was at least a uh, part of the brainstorm on 9-11. I think the, some of the uh, planning probably came out of that plan. Yeah, I mean, when people uh, criticize conspiracy theorists as saying that maybe there's a switch out that occurred with those planes. And that's, that's a crazy idea. Well, just cite northwards. That's the... A plan submitted by the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to President Kennedy in 1962. So, correct. <laughs> that's what they're thinking. Now, going back to the planes, is my my chief problem with that is what I'm seeing. I'm seeing an aluminum plane, a, a hundred ton aluminum plane, cut through a five hundred thousand ton steel reinforced concrete building. And my understanding of physics is, it would have the same effect as if the buildings were coming at the plane. Planes were were st standing still, and the buildings were coming at them at 500 miles an hour. The aluminum wouldn't cut through the through, through the steel reinforced concrete. They, they'd shrivel up and you smash and fall to the ground. Uh, which didn't happen. Yeah, which didn't happen. It cut through, and I've yet to hear a other than uh, I guess ridicule when someone brings that up. Uh, that's crazy because there I saw planes there. Were planes there, and we're, we're all told planes were involved. Um, I still haven't had anyone explained to me how that's physically possible because I don't think it is physically possible. And if it's not physically possible, how did it occur? And that, that's where I'm stuck. <laughs> so, well, I think that yeah. uh, the holograph uh, yeah. might explain that. Uh, we're seeing uh, an illusion that the, it, it, there is a missile hitting, and I think as it does that, you've probably heard of the Israeli art students yeah. who had opened up a, a, a gap in the walls of the World Trade Center um, I think that there were pre-planted explosives that also went off uh, when that missile hit. Uh, no, I, I say there's no doubt about that. And I also think that the people at A and E for 9/11 Truth are correct about thermite. Uh, there was melting that was going on before the big explosion that took the buildings down. There was melting steel. Uh, you can see it dripping down the side of the tower. Um, so I do believe that there were other uh, factors here, but I don't believe, certainly don't believe the original government explanation of a uh, 590 mile an hour and possibly fast airplane flying like the hot knife through butter through with its aluminum parts, its tail and its wings going through the this 14 inch steel columns. Can't happen. It's never happened before. Couldn't happen. Physically impossible. Yeah, it's like Looney Tunes physics, I guess. No. Yeah. Oh, well, the famous uh, road uh, roadrunner coyote with a coyote, yeah. uh, he slams into a wall and you see the image of him in the wall. And we know he can't do that. We know an aluminum plane can't do it either. Well, I suppose what it is, this is the effect is we've, we we all saw it on television. That's again, that, go back. That's where the vast majority of people experienced 9-11 was on television through a medium. Uh, uh, and so that is subject to all types of manipulation. Of course, we have – a history of media manipulation, media fakery, and, and other stories that have been exposed, um, whether it's the Gulf War, um, you know, them faking uh, faking Scud missile attacks, the green screen, or then there's blue screen technology. <laughs> you know? So uh, there's no reason why we, we should put any stock in what we're seeing on television and, and assuming that it, it's necessarily uh, showing us reality and it can be manipulated. Um so that's – I mean the technology is there I guess. But um, again, uh, most people just – you know, I guess we're told it was it – was, there were planes and they saw planes and that's the you – know, to them that's reality. Uh, I guess what, what's the problem I think is when you, when you present the problems of basic physics to this, it's not so much the physics that bothers people. It's the implication of the question you're creating.
Oh yeah. Okay. So here we're back. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think it's the implication when pointing out the implications of of these anomalies that most people have trouble with because it's well, not it's uh, you're blowing apart their paradigm or their 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 idea of reality and the institutions, even the medium that they rely on for information, if it's exposed to being so unreliable, um, you know, it, where do they stand at that point? You know, so. If, yeah, you've uh, you're blowing their paradigm for uh, well for everything. Uh, you know, the whole uh, truth movement uh, is doing that. But in case of nine uh, eleven and the planes, they've seen those planes hit the towers so often. I think it's it's comparable to what they call the big lie effect. If you you told someone uh, often enough, you believe it's true, and if you've seen something often enough, the footage of it, you think that's true. I mean, you've seen it, so seen is believing. So the idea that it wasn't what you you saw and you accepted for so many years is is pretty hard. And but I congratulate anybody who um, has the uh, mental uh, and spiritual wherewithal to overcome uh, what they've uh, been mistaught and unlearn it. Yeah. And I think we we saw that with the media. You know, this. Um, I, although I'm not a big Trump guy. Uh, I felt that, like many of us, that Hillary Clinton had to be stopped at all costs. We know the Rothschilds were behind her. Lynn Forrested de Rothschild came out before the election and told Yahoo Financial that she was she should be president. And uh, they even had George H.W. Bush come out, only president that I know of, has ever said he's going to vote for the other party. He said he was going to vote for Hillary. They pulled out all the stops, and mainstream media lost because so many people have turned off mainstream media and are turning to alt media like your show. So uh, there are people waking up, and I, I just take that as a great encouragement. Well, which is why you have now have this fake news. <laughs> yeah, that's being um, that's almost like conspiracy theory, and I'm not. I wouldn't be too surprised if fake news was conjured up at Langley too, just as conspiracy yeah. theory was. It's the new buzzword, and it's yeah. payback for our victory over Hillary Clinton. Uh, they, they're going to attack every. You know, I'm sure you've seen, heard of the, the uh, new. Um, uh, Intelligence Authorization Act for 2016, where they were going to go after Russian propaganda sites. And the Washington Post at the same time was publishing uh, Corbett Report and uh, uh, Activist Post and all these other good. Uh, even the Ron Paul Institute was supposedly Russian propaganda. No proof offered, they, but they yeah. said there's Russian propaganda, you know. Well, they said Russia uh, tried to influence the elections. And I said, well, <laughs> they hacked the elections, sure. You know, that was what, a good one. <laughs> what, what does influence mean, by the way? I mean, my, my position was if, if indeed that uh, the Russians were behind hacking the uh, email accounts of the, uh, of the Clinton cabal and they exposed – and thus expose their, you know, their criminality and their, the de- degeneracy and all that. Well, then don't we owe a Putin and company a big thank you? <laughs> yeah, it sounds like he was doing Julian Assange's work for him. But Assange to- said uh, that it was not the Russians who gave him the information. Of course, oh, yeah. he was he was uh, revealing stuff for years, and nobody ever said it was the Russians. It's just it was a yeah. last minute ploy to try to get the electors to change their mind, uh, you know, and to switch well, from the Trump big suspect to- is probably. The folks at NSA and CIA. Uh-huh. I mean, yeah, because they they can read all those emails anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's obvious. They, they, right they, they get to watch this show before you air it. I mean, you know. You know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and so that's the obvious uh, suspect right there. Just elements within the national national security state had decided that uh, they had maybe they had enough of Clinton, or maybe the elites, so, uh, a few oligarchs themselves, decided. That uh, Clinton, you know, was too ill or too corrupt or whatever, and they just they decide to, uh, you know, to back uh, in their in, the, in their own way back uh, back Trump, and that's there's a civil war going on inside the uh, the deep state. That's what it what it appears to be going on, and and that's probably you know what did occur to some one extent or another. WikiLeaks WikiLeaks itself is probably some sort of controlled leak mechanism for the national security state. That said, what they've leaked. Has always turned out to be at least genuine. I mean, it's a question of what is leaked, right? <laughs> so, mm-hmm. could uh, be selective, right? Yeah, and so you can infer from what's leaked and what gets out, and uh, what happens is perhaps uh, the machinations of the of, of the oligarchs uh, that they, um, you know, that there may be a few faction uh, uh, or a few within that group decided to back uh, Trump for one reason or another. And you know, like I said, probably perhaps because Clinton. Was regarded as being too corrupt, too compromised, and too ill to, to be useful in the White House. 
Right. Wow. Uh, with the way she was collapsing physically, uh, yeah. I don't see how she could have survived the term anyway. And the, there are some indications from at least Trump's very, very pro-Israel uh, position, although Hillary was just as pro-Israel, that they might be completely happy with Trump. <clears throat> but there's one other aspect of this that I mentioned at the close of my article, and it's more of a somber note, but uh, the Rothschilds half owned the, the Economist, and you probably you must have seen the 2017 mm-hmm. cover. Uh, well, it's called the World in 2017, and they're famous for their predictive covers. Uh, the previous year's cover predicted the Paris attacks, you know, when it would happen, mm-hmm. um, uh, at least according to some analysts who have looked at it. And the 2017 World cover has eight tarot cards on it, which is further implication that they are indeed Luciferians. But the death card is a picture of death watching a nuclear bomb exploding. And so that uh, certainly gives one pause. Now, of course, that could just be a psyop mm-hmm. to uh, chill us. Uh, but um, uh, we've uh, talked about their obsession with nukes going back to the days of Ben Gurion and uh, the nuclear spine and Victor Rothschild, who was Jacob Rothschild's um, father. And we talk about world wars. You know, World War I got them their League of Nations, their Balfour Declaration of the Soviet Union. World War II got them their their World Bank, their UN, their State of Israel, and spread communism over half the globe. And probably they believed to get their final world government seated in Jerusalem with a world currency and a world police state would probably take another world war, which it would be hard to imagine a world war at this point would not involve nuclear weapons to some extent. So I am concerned about that cover. And uh, what I said in my article was, I, I think that at the close of my article, I said that I think we need to be doing a lot of praying. Um, and I also think that uh, if there is somebody who could maybe stand in the gap uh, and prevent that kind of thing from happening, it might be Vladimir Putin. There is a spiritual revival happening right now in Russia. I'm convinced of that from talking to, uh, well, you know, Dean Arnold and mm-hmm. uh, I, it's Orthodox Christians I know. Uh, as Putin has already stood in their way. Uh, in Syria, just today we had this assassination of the uh, Russian ambassador to mm-hmm. Turkey. Things are heating up, but I believe uh, that if they wanted to, to use a false flag to start World War III, and here's where the, the, the plane holograms come into uh, account, maybe next time, maybe next time they launch, don't launch cruise missiles, maybe next time Israel launches a n- real high yield nuclear missile, maybe against America. This time cloaked as a Russian bomber, or maybe they launch it against Russia. This time cloaked as an American bomber. I don't know how they would carry it out. I'm not still completely wedded to the idea that they did cloak cruise missiles as uh, jetliners on 9/11, but I, I believe that is is where the evidence is pointing. But I am concerned that they can launch something. So if anybody could prevent that, I believe it would be Vladimir Putin to tell Netanyahu directly. If you launch an airstrike, a nuclear strike on America or Russia in an effort to ignite a World War III for your world government dreams, then uh, Tel Aviv is going to get payback. And that would give them pause to not do that and to think about that because uh, there's one thing they do fear, and that is military might, um, that and the wrath of God. So um, uh, that is... uh, Kind of where I, that's where I left the article. I do believe we are in a very, uh, dangerous time in, uh, world history and a time when we need to look at where we stand spiritually and be doing everything we can to continue to spread the truth to people and to awaken the masses to the dangers that they face, uh, both on a physical and a spiritual plane. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, the, uh, are you familiar with Paul and Philip Collins? No, uh, they're, they're a writing duo. They they put an article a while back called "Blackmailed by the Bomb: mm-hmm. Nuclear Anxiety and the Cult of the Superweapon," and uh, they opened up the article with the um, ex- with the uh, uh, revelation or the reporting of Seymour Hirsch regarding the assassination of Benazir Bhutto. How uh-huh. it was it was a JSOC uh, uh, operation ordered by Sandy McChrystal because she had revealed um, that uh, the AQ Khan network was getting help from the West, Western intelligence agencies, to proliferate nuclear weapons. And I'm, I'm going to abbreviate this greatly because it's a very long article, but just to explain their thesis. Uh, it, what happened was 
out of the uh, Afghan war when the, we were backing the Mujahideen. Part of that program uh, in getting the Pakistanis to help us in that, that, in that uh, operation, I think it was Operation Cyclone, the U.S. turned a blind eye to nuclear proliferation and also funded it because all the funding going there, a lot of, lot, a lot of the money was taken away from that operation and paid for Pakistan's n- nuclear bomb program. And the U.S. just uh, turned, turned a blind eye to it and let them do it in return for their help in, in Afghanistan. Uh, so that's how they got the bomb. And a lot of this was uh, a, that she threatened to expose this because she was going to subject the Acucon network to IAEA inspection. So she was taken out. So it dates back to, to, that, to the Afghan war period. But, it, but more than that, um, uh, the, uh, what happened was uh, when the – this goes back to the Manhattan Project is the, there were two ideas, uh, two camps – they called for it was Pax Universe Pax Universalis or Pax Americana. The idea was America was was, was going to use its uh, monopoly of, of the atomic bomb to impose a new world order, a one world government. And there are elements within the Manhattan Project who wanted to to pro, uh, give Russia the bomb uh, and spread uh, so uh, there would be so it would uh, heighten Cold War tension. And nuclear fear, they would bring about an excuse for world government, uh, international control of, of atomic weapons, and this would be a prelude to new world government. Mm-hmm. And what happened was Stalin didn't really uh, cooperate properly. Stalin became more of a nationalist than during the Cold War and didn't submit to uh, international control of nuclear weapons, and, and then you in, they inadvertently got the arms race. This is what they say in the article, in their argument. But he says, but even deeper than that is there was a plan. This goes back to this idea of a cult of a super weapon, and this goes back to the days of H. G. Wells, and the way they called the Coefficients Club, which was a Fabian society in, in England, sort of the movers and shakers of the British Empire. And what they needed to do was to create a weapon to dominate the planet, create a, a, an envir- a global environment of fear and tension, to create to create an environment that would be conducive to. Or create a pretext for world government, and that's pretty much what the, what the article is about. It's called "Blackmailed by the Bomb: Nuclear Anxiety and the Cult of the Superweapon." Um, I'm not doing it justice. You have to read the article. <laughs> sure, but very to... interesting. And uh, perhaps uh, there was always talk about Stalin being poisoned or otherwise assassinated, yeah. and perhaps his failure to cooperate in uh, that uh, goes back to the this obsessive. Um, Utilization of the atomic bomb for geopolitical objectives, mm-hmm. and this is what they said: the the, the deeper ideological reasons uh, uh, stem from a, what literary critic H. Uh, Bruce Franklin describes as the cult of the superweapon, which has originated as a distinct phenomenon between 1880, what we now uh, nonchalantly call the First World War, and a form of future wars imagined by American authors of fiction. And there's there are articles like, there there are like short stories in McClure's which Truman read, and of course it, the term atomic bomb it was coined by H. G. Wells. In, 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 in a, in a I didn't movie. even know that. Yeah. Uh, very predictive H. Uh, G. Wells. Uh, yeah. You know, the War of the Worlds. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but, uh, yeah, I lost my train of thought there. You'll have to edit that uh, that out. Uh, okay, I'll pick it up. Uh, another place, uh, another item that uh, comes to mind, of course, when we talk about the super weapon is uh, there was a movie called Dr. Strangelove mm-hmm. that came out in 1964, which is the same year they announced the plan for the World Trade Center, where the... Uh, there's this rogue general who launches a nuclear attack on Russia, which they are unable to correct or call, re, re, recall. And uh, Guess what, Jack, the, entire, the, entire, the entire planet is nuked. And, but there's another movie that same year called Fail Safe, uh, kind of comparable scenario. In this case, a computer glitch causes America to launch a nuclear strike on Moscow, which can't be called back. And but it's a limited nuclear war. And in this scenario, after not Moscow is nuked to prevent Russia from retaliating and destroying the world, the American president orders New York City to be nuked, and they use uh, the Empire State Building as ground zero, which is eerily uh, uh, brings to mind the World Trade Center. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, mm-hmm. that came out the same year, again, 1964. So kind of two options. There are a limited nuclear war or an all-out nuclear war. And I think what they're looking for is a limited nuclear war to frighten us into thinking there could be a Dr. Strangelove outcome 
uh, with the entire, uh, all life being wiped out on Earth. Uh, I think they want a limited event. Uh, it is strange that they have allowed places like Pakistan, and I know that Israel has shared nuclear technology with uh, other countries as well. It doesn't really seem to make a lot of sense that they want nuclear technology in the hands of so many uh, nations which they can't necessarily control the militaries of. It's almost if they want to get something going, you know, put a put a uh, uh, put the brakes on it, and then have humanity so frightened by what's happened that they would accept at any cost to get peace and security a world government. Well, that seems to be the psyop of both those movies. Not, well, with Doctor Strange, of sort of as, uh, of course, a satire of the crazy, you know, national security state, the Cold War period. But the end result, the end, the outcome, or at least the uh, what we really get out of those movies is sort of a, a, a psyop terrorizing humanity because this is the, the this is the result when you have nation states with their you know respective arsenals and the only way you can get around that is if you have world government where mm-hmm. everything is brought under world control the question is who's going to be controlled that world government right and that was yeah. the the uh, how they got the the league of nations was out of world war one they got mm-hmm. the un out of world war two we must prevent at all costs another world war right and so it makes sense that they'd let a, some, a nuke or more than one nuke go off and um, to bring about the ultimate UN, the ultimate League of Nations that would have uh, power over every nation. And any nation that didn't go along would uh, have it uh, self uh, uh, reprimanded uh, militarily by a, a world military force. That was the, the original intent of the UN, you know, to be a peacekeeper. It's right, right in their very first plank of the UN charter. So, um, yeah, they're definitely aiming for that, and we definitely want to keep aiming for to maintain national sovereignty, sanity, and uh, a, a world that uh, that uh, we we can uh, uh, love and, and live in in peace. And what they decided was war was the best way to bring about this fundamental change in society. <laughs> yeah, that's the ultimate yeah. psyop, ultimate social engineering. Yeah, that, war. and that goes right back to. Uh, the early investigations were made into the uh, Carnegie uh, Institute for uh, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, you know, the Reese Committee investigator who looked into that and found they were using war as a means to bring about this this permanent global peace. Yeah, it was Nor- Norman Dodd and his mm-hmm. uh, investigator Catherine Casey. Yep. Yes, exactly. About the foundation. So, so. well, mm-hmm. James, I want to thank you for coming back on the show, talking about the article. It's a great article. I, I recommend everyone go back and read it. Uh, and uh, go to your site and, of course, read your other materials and also read your books. And I will wish you Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Merry Christmas to you, Tim. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.